Hello and welcome to the Surviving Constitutional Law Podcast. I'm your host, Cameron Shamsabad. Today, on our inaugural episode of this podcast, uh, I'm going to be talking about some of the basics of constitutional law. And when I mean basics, I mean going to the very root and foundation of the actual topic itself. Uh, I've decided to start at a place where you would normally go probably before constitutional law, this is the real prelude, you'd probably get an introduction to law or something in your very first semester. The reason why is because I find a lot of students, by the time they reach that very first lecture or class in constitutional law, normally they find that they have sort of forgotten the foundations and the basis. So what we're going to do today is we're going to discuss, and I'm going to, I'm going to tell you all about sort of what the constitution is, why it's important, what the uh, necessities of having a constitution and also some of the really important key features which are going to be recurring throughout the the numerous podcasts that we're going to have some of the very important and intrinsic concepts to this actual area of law the core of the episode today is really going to be centered around the idea of what is a constitution and why is it important that you have one in a country answering that question from the very beginning today and I'm going to do my best to answer that question for you, uh, really does allow us to frame the entire podcast and allows us to frame a discussion about this topic going forward. It allows you as a listener, whether you're a, a law student or someone who's just listening in, to understand exactly why you should keep listening and why this is a topic which actually has some significance and some importance to your life and also to the country that you're living in. From a discussion of, you know, what a constitution is, we're going to be moving on to some of the history of our constitution, particularly the UK and also the United States influences that we've had, as well as a a little bit, I don't want to cover too much today to bore you, but a little bit on federation and the framers of our constitution. Following from that point, I'll discuss the key features of our constitution, very broadly speaking, including the idea of federalism, Uh, as well as separation of powers, the system of government we have, which is the Westminster system of government, which has very large and prominent features within our uh, country, as well as the idea of constitutional amendment and how we can actually change the constitution. Ultimately, I'll hope to conclude on where the podcast is going from here and what you can expect on on, on our next episode of the podcast. So just sit back, relax. This should be a relatively short episode today, uh, but let's dive into some of the more interesting parts of the topic. So what is a constitution? Why is it an important thing for a country to have a constitution? These are questions which sometimes I get from students, but more often I usually receive from people who are just speaking to me on the subject, whenever they ask me what I've been doing with my studies. Uh, It could be family members, it could be neighbours, it could be just, you know, interested people that you might speak to every day in society. They ask me, what exactly is a constitution? Well, a constitution, broadly speaking, is a set of fundamental principles and precedents which form the legal basis of either a political entity, a corporate entity or potentially just a social organization. Examples could be, for example, your local soccer club or on the other side of that it could be a large company like a a bank or something like that. These all have a certain type of constitution in order to actually function which sets the framework upon which they function. In terms of governments, which is what we're really focusing on in this podcast and what you focus on in law school quite a lot, Constitutions are usually written and codified into either one or potentially a number of documents that are legally binding. The UK is an example of a country that doesn't actually have a written constitution in any single document, but actually is governed by a number of written as well as unwritten uh, legal and political precedents, as well as some statutes which have come to form the basis of their country. In terms of written constitutions, which is much more common in the modern era, the Indian constitution is actually probably the longest, with over 400 articles being included, ranging from 
all matter of uh, subjects, not just the framework for government, but actually how the government's functioning and a huge number of um, rights and powers are actually involved. The United States has another very well-known written constitution. It's probably the one which in the modern era has taken the most attention around the world, and it's considered generally the oldest within the modern period uh, in terms of constitutional law. The Constitution of the Republic of San Marino is probably the oldest in the world, however, uh, and it actually dates back to 1600 in the Common Era. It is a less known fact of constitutional law that the Republic of San Marino has that history, but as I'm about to explain, there is a quite a long history of constitutions and the development of constitutions around the world. And in order to understand the way we actually have gotten to this point in history, where we have modern countries with modern precedents and modern legal documents, we really need to understand that these ideas are quite universal and go back quite a long way in our human history. Before going into that history, though, the question still is outstanding exactly as to why a constitution is actually important. Well, we know it is a framework, but why exactly? Is that framework necessary? The answer to that could be summarized in a very brief sense that constitutional documents are both legally and politically significant as they set out the powers and limitations that exist upon the government. They create the parameters within which authority can be legally exercised. Anything outside those parameters would be, and is considered in most cases around the world, invalid and unbinding upon the people. The reason we have this sort of approach to constitutional law and modern constitutions is it goes back to the Enlightenment period a few centuries ago, where men like Thomas Paine, who were writing at the time, came up with the idea that a government has to be constrained and has to be limited. Thomas Paine once very famously wrote in The Rights of Man that a constitution is not the act of a government, but of a people constituting a government. And a government without a constitution is a power without right. That principle which Thomas Paine was discussing is the essential idea of the rule of law, that we as the people who establish the government set the limits upon what the government can do, and that the government is bound to follow those limits and work within those limits. At the same time, we've given the government certain powers by constituting it, that it has certain responsibilities and it's to engage in certain conduct. So the significance of a constitution and constitutional law generally could be summarized that it really is the basis for not only the powers that the government can exercise, but also the powers that the government cannot exercise. It's the method by which we as lawyers are able to actually protect the citizenry from the overreach of government, from the exertion of arbitrary power very often. So it's a very important thing to have a well-functioning and well-structured constitution, as it really sets the foundation for the legal and the political system that you have in your country. So the roots of these ideas don't just start in the modern era or in the Enlightenment era, but actually go back quite a long time into ancient times, where we don't see necessarily constitutions like we have today, which are quite extensive and especially in the very modern constitutions, quite broad and set out a number of um, provisions. But actually we see elements of modern constitutional law being exercised in the ancient world. All the way back in, in ancient Athens, we can see the example of written and codified laws, in that the Athenian penal laws were actually codified by the scribe Draco around 651 BCE, setting out harsh penalties, including the death penalty for many offences. This is actually where we get the word draconian, for those of you who don't know, for things that are actually very harsh or, or heavily punished, despite not actually being incredibly serious in the eyes of most people. Later, the Athenians developed what was called the Solonian Constitution, which was formed uh, under the rule of Solon, determining many issues, not just about criminal law, but also things like labor laws, and most importantly, a concept which is actually now in modern constitutional law in many countries, the idea at that point of a aristocratic class membership and, and the laws and rules actually determining your membership in that class, which can be sort of 
related to the modern time where we have citizenship norms set out in constitutions. The Romans also developed a semi-codified constitutional system starting around 450 BCE with the codification of what's called the Twelve Tables, setting out the rights and duties of Roman citizens. Over the course of the centuries, obviously, the Romans developed quite a complex constitutional system, and it was obviously, over that time, abrogated and reformed by legislators and dictators alike, such as Sulla and also Julius Caesar, before inevitably becoming an imperial state under the many emperors which ruled. Staying in the, in the ancient era, but moving into the east, into Asia, you can find that in India, the edicts of Ashoka were created by the Emperor Ashoka in the 3rd century BCE and set out, among other things, many basic principles for the powerful Mauryan Empire to actually rule by. The edicts were not only political but also social, but you can see many of, many of the common norms and principles that constitutions today embody being embodied within the edicts of Ashoka. These are all, obviously, examples much more primitive than what we have today, but the ideas seem to have grown from that point of time forward coming into the modern era. We can also find many other examples throughout the Middle Ages as well, whether they be in Japan, Wales, or the Anglo-Saxon kingdoms of England. One such example throughout the Middle Ages was the Charter of Medina, which was drafted by the Prophet Muhammad around 622 CE, which is, in its very definition, a constituting document in that it established and set out the relationship between the various Arab tribes and consolidated them into one people, thereby establishing a multi-religious Islamic state in Medina at that point in time. It really does have many of the elements which we look at in modern constitutional law as being sort of fundamental to a constitution in that it does create a sort of legal norm and it does consolidate a bunch of people into one, so one social grouping and govern them by a certain set of norms and principles. Similarly, in China, the Hongwu Emperor created and refined a document called the Ancestral Injunctions. These rules served in a very practical sense as a constitution for the Ming Dynasty for about 250 years. Across the globe, the Iroquois Confederacy of Native Americans also formed a tribal democracy through an oral constitution they referred to as the Great Law of Peace. Scholars today believe that this occurred somewhere between 1100 and 1500 CE, and it persisted for quite some time, obviously until the point of colonization in the North American continent. Now this list is by no means exhaustive. There are many other examples which you can find, and I would encourage you, if you're interested in the history of these ideas, go and have a look at uh, some ancient, some medieval, and some Renaissance history. You can find a number of examples of constitutional ideas and where they've come from. The reason I've set out these examples is because it shows the diversity of places where constitutional ideas have come from, and the different examples shows that while we may have a sort of Western-centric idea of constitutional law at the moment, because in the modern era, Enlightenment principles from the Western Enlightenment have dominated, the reality is that these ideas are quite universal, and every society has tried to implement them in a certain way. Now, with that being said, I would stress that, especially in Australia, the constitutional influences have predominantly been formed from the Enlightenment period and from the common law tradition within the American and English history, and that's where I'm now going to move on to, uh, as both of those histories, both in the English and the American traditions, play a significant role in how our constitution was actually developed and written by our framers. Now, given modern Australia was founded by British settlement, our common law legal system was almost directly derived from the United Kingdom. As such, many aspects of our constitution was formed by the norms of English law and some important historical influences of the United Kingdom that I would like to just point out very quickly uh, were, for example, the presence of the Crown, which was established in 1066 CE by William the Conqueror. The English Crown became the basis of the legal and political system in the UK and to this day the monarch of Australia is actually shared with the United Kingdom and is endowed with executive powers according to our constitution. Still to this point in time, prosecutions throughout the country is actually done in the name of the Queen or in the name of the Crown. 
uh, the, the crown lands you often hear referred to in property law and things like that. It means public. So the, the authority of the crown is still the basis of the Westminster and the English traditional system of government, which we've actually inherited. Common law tradition doesn't necessarily require a crown, though, uh, as you can see in countries like the United States, but obviously in Australia, where we haven't departed significantly from the English tradition, we have inherited the crown of the UK, and obviously through our constitution established in a rather unusual phenomena, our own crown. Another element of the English uh, system that we've actually had brought into our constitution was the parliament. Documents such as the Magna Carta in 1215 CE were formed to curb the authority of the king and give greater rights to the aristocracy who would later form the parliament in the UK. Following the English Civil War in the period surrounding the 17th century, the parliament established its supremacy over the monarchy in exercising the crown's authority within the country. The English protectorate that was actually set up by Oliver Cromwell in the period of the Civil War, after obviously defeating the king, promulgated the first detailed written constitution adopted by a modern state, and it was called the Instrument of Government. This formed the basis of government for the very short-lived republic that existed in the UK from 1653 to 1657 by providing a legal rationale for the increasing power of Cromwell after the parliament consistently failed to govern effectively in England. The country which was obviously established, the Commonwealth of England, as it was referred to, uh, is, is actually still today referred to um, not only in the, the, in the United States, but also in Australia, we, we have a federal government that we call the Commonwealth. So a lot of our legal ideas come from that period. Most of the concepts and ideas embedded in our modern constitutional theory actually come from this period of English history, uh, particularly the concept of bicameralism, which is having two separate houses of parliament, a separation of powers between the executive, legislative and judicial branches, as well as a written constitution, which, as I stated, was used to justify the powers of Oliver Cromwell and his government. Probably one of the most significant things that we did actually inherit from the British was the common law tradition. Now, an essential feature of our country and its legal system is actually the common law, which is embedded within our constitution. This includes, of course, the adversarial legal system, with the legal rights attached to it, and also the basis for our judiciary and the concept of judicial review, which are things which in our constitution we actually utilize quite a lot to determine constitutional norms and what is and is not constitutional. Now, another nation which played a significant role in influencing Australia's constitutional law and the foundations of our constitution was the United States, which happens to be another really significant country which broke off from the English tradition. Now, the United States, during its Revolutionary War, beginning in 1776, obviously declared its independence from the British and proceeded to form a new kind of Republican government, which was the first of its kind for uh, the world at that time. It was based upon not only principles from the Enlightenment and scientific rationalism and this new ideas of capitalism which started to be formed from the uh, English English system of government, but also it came from the idea of natural law and the idea of natural rights, which hadn't taken, taken root in the United Kingdom as heavily as they did now in the United States. The United States Constitution, as it was advocated in the Federalist Papers, written by John Jay, Alexander Hamilton, and of course James Madison, influenced quite profoundly the Australian constitutional law in a number of very important regards. I'm going to touch on this subject a little bit more later and definitely in future podcasts I'm going to talk about our federation conventions in a little bit more detail and I would love to be able to talk about American constitutional law because it's so fascinating. But just sticking to the basics at the moment, there are two very fundamental principles which Australia has taken from the United States which should be uh, noted because they pop up quite a lot. One of them is the idea of federalism. So whenever the United States Constitution was adop adopted, it enumerated the limited power base 
of the national government in the Constitution and actually reserved all other powers to the states. The Constitution, by doing so, recognised that those state governments were having some sort of inherent authority and they were actually forming the basis for the federal government that actually was being created. So this actually acknowledges the sovereignty of each separate state within the Union as having its own identity and its own inherent authority, which is separable from the national polity which they had obviously created. This is contrasted with countries like the United Kingdom or mainland European countries where you see smaller subdivisions within the system, smaller governments, whether they be municipal or, or regional or any of those sorts of governments, having their authority derived or delegated to them from the national government. Whereas in the United States and in federal systems of government that are, well, I guess truly federal, the power actually goes from the bottom up. So you'll see that the state governments are delegating powers to the new national government to work on a very limited basis. Now, in future podcasts, I'll be discussing how this principle gets abrogated and how the lines get blurred and how federal governments actually usurp a lot more power than they were intended to have over the course of time. But ultimately, for our purposes right now, it's just important to recognise that the United States is the basis for our influence on this subject and that Australia has a federal system on that model. Aside from the idea of federalism, though, we also adapted what the United States regards as a separation of powers. This is more on the American model than on the British model in our constitutional document. In particular, the United States decided it would go in a very unique direction in that it separated the powers of the government in quite a strict fashion and in a fashion which still today is is quite unprecedented in very few countries actually do have a separation of powers in such a strict fashion. Specifically that the United States has a separation between the three arms of government, particularly the, the legislature, which is the Congress, the executive, which is the presidency, and the judiciary, which is the Supreme Court. And these three arms of government are quite well empowered and ultimately because they are separate from each other, constantly vying for a sort of uh, dominance and predominance within the American political system. And you can see that each one checks and balances the powers of the other two in its own way and in its own fashion. Justice Antonin Scalia of the United States Supreme Court once said that this created a system of what is otherwise uh, contradicting powers, which diffuses the pursuit of any one branch of government to actually centralise ultimate authority and, and attain too much power in its own, in its own uh, body. Now, if you, if you think about the American system in that regard, you'll see sometimes, and I know this is obviously touching on more current events, but let's say Trump with his border wall or, or something like that, you see that the uh, Supreme Court is hearing matters and, and issuing injunctions against his actions. You see that the Congress is passing laws trying to prevent him from doing things or prohibiting him from making certain spendings. You, you can see that there's a constant tug of war between the three branches of government checking each other when any one branch of government starts to step up and poke its head out too much. The purpose of this was to prevent what was happening in the United Kingdom, and this is obviously something which uh, we'll we'll discuss more, but the idea that Parliament in the United Kingdom was sovereign and therefore it could more or less overawe the other two branches of government within their separation. Or further back, the idea of uh, tyrants, going all the way back to the ancient history we discussed, who would centralise the power to be judge, jury, executioner, lawmaker, all in their own person. The Americans saw this as a great evil that they wanted to protect against, the idea that one person could have all that power, or that one body of people could have all that power. So it doesn't necessarily mean that just because you're a group of parliamentarians that you should have all that authority to do what you want. There should be checks and balances is what the Americans believed. And in that idea, we actually did embrace that to a significant degree in Australia. But the difficulty is, in Australia, we also adapted the Westminster principles, 
uh, which I'm going to touch on a little bit later, as being the foundational point for uh, how we run our governments day to day. And that obviously has quite a profound influence on the separation of powers. And it means that our separation of powers is not in fact as strict as the United States uh, equivalent. Nonetheless, our constitution is separated between uh, the first chapter, second chapter and third chapter, all concerning the legislature, executive and the judiciary. So the the concept in terms of drafting is directly from the US, though day to day our system functions quite differently. So these influences which we got from the United Kingdom and also the United States really culminated into the creation of our contemporary constitution during the conventions which were held around Australia between the year 1890 and 1898. These conventions which were held all over the uh, colonial states of Australia were fundamentally about, first of all, establishing the willpower to become one, one nation, one country, and aside from that, going further and discussing and debating what we wanted that union of states to look like in the future. In doing this, each colony really did choose some of its best and brightest to go and represent them and represent their interests. And there was very robust debates during that period, which I hope I can cover in future podcasts, about what our country should look like. And some of the main debates were actually about these influences in particular and whether we should go in a more Canadian and British direction with our federation or if we should go in an American direction with our federation. Ultimately, the decision seems to have come out more American in the eyes of most legal scholars, but our subsequent legal developments through the High Court have pushed our system much more in a Westminster and an English fashion. Nonetheless, I will quickly mention that some of our uh, predominant and very profound uh, influential drafters of the Constitution were eminent legal and political figures of the period. And I would actually like to just note, for those who don't know, there were five in particular who really deserve your attention if you're interested in the history of this period. The first one is Sir Samuel Griffith, who was at one point the Premier of Queensland, as well as the Chief Justice of Queensland. But he was also the inaugural Chief Justice of the High Court of Australia and draws the academic as well as the uh, political uh, respect of quite a lot of people for those reasons. He played a very significant role in not only advocating for the Constitution from the very earliest convention until the very last convention, but also in drafting the Constitution. Another is Andrew Inglis Clark, who was at the early conventions, though in the 1897 and 98 conventions he he wasn't present. Andrew Inglis Clark was the Attorney General of Tasmania, and he was also later a Tasmanian Supreme Court Justice. And he was considered to be an expert on American constitutional law. And it's from him we can get, um, we can trace actually a lot of the American influences in our constitution because he advocated quite strongly for principles of American federalism, separation of powers, and a number of other things. Another uh, very influential framer was Charles Kingston, who was the Premier of South Australia and a member of the first National Executive Cabinet. Now, Mr. Kingston was uh, extremely influential in our process because he actually came up with one of the original drafts of the Constitution, which was used by the uh, drafting committee in putting together a very early idea of what our Constitution would look like. The last two who I would mention were more significant in the later conventions, though they became quite influential, obviously, in Australian history. The first one is Sir Edmund Barton, who was Australia's first Prime Minister, as well as an inaugural High Court Justice. Barton was very influential at the 1898 convention in particular, and he led quite a lot of the debates in that convention as to what our constitution would look like. He was joined in those debates by Richard O'Connor, who was a New South Wales Minister, and also an inaugural High Court Justice as well. And... If you, can, if you look at the uh, very late debates of that period in the 1890s, you can see these two really were uh, intellectually adding quite a lot to the discussion that was going on. 
and really gave their tick of approval and their legal expertise towards what the Constitution would inevitably become. Once the Constitution had been drafted and the conventions had concluded, it was sent to uh, the Imperial Parliament in the United Kingdom, and once it was approved by the British Parliament, it came into effect on the 1st of January 1901. This last point that I'm making should immediately uh, tell, tell you the difference between the Australian and the American constitutions. In the United States, the War of Independence and the Declaration of Independence was all about creating uh, sort of the sovereignty of all these different colonies independent from each other. So they, they managed to actually win that war and become independent. And then subsequent to that, they went on the process of forming one country through the basis of first the Articles of Confederation and then later the United States Constitution, which persists until the present time. These independent sovereign states which had declared their independence from the British Empire formed their own government, which now persists, is a very, very different history to the one which we had in Australia, where our colonial delegates were attending these conventions really with the oversight and the encouragement and ultimately the approval of the British Empire. On that basis, we don't have a revolutionary constitution, but we have a constitution which is very, very much in the British legal tradition. It was passed by the Imperial Parliament. It is an act of the British Parliament. So it very much is a constitution that fits within the legal tradition as opposed to the revolutionary uh, ideas camp. On that basis, you could say that our constitution was much more conservative in the way that it was formed. And our drafters were extremely conservative in their views about the mother country, about their identity, and that view ultimately persisted for quite some time. The, the notion of Australia being an independent, sovereign nation with its own culture and its own identity took some time to take root. And you can see that through the histories of the early 20th century, Australians, even when they were forming their own independent identity, had that linked very strongly to the British Empire and the idea of uh, being a British subject. On that basis, I... I'm comfortable now to move forward because I've set out that distinction between the Australian and the American Constitution on some of the key principles of our Constitution which not only remain very, very important today but also have changed quite significantly since the time our framers came up with them. So one of the key features that was implemented in our Constitution that I mentioned earlier is the concept of federalism. And the idea that the state governments have a sort of inherent authority and that we are creating a federal government which is the power resonating from the bottom and uh, going up to the top. So the Commonwealth was to be uh, created on that basis. Now our federal arrangement has been a key point in our demo democracy for over a century, though in that time it has really radically changed. Um, from being more state-centric to being more uh, commonwealth-centric. And the reason it's changed can be put down to a number of influences over time, over the past hundred years in particular, whether they be political, economic or social. Though the pinpoint you can look to where things really started to alter direction really was the uh, engineers case which took place in 1920. And that really did change what the framers had in mind and move things in a completely different direction. So what our framers had in mind was a much more conservative approach to, to Commonwealth authority and Commonwealth power, sticking within the limits which were quite well, quite, quite well defined in the Constitution and leaving everything else to the state governments to do. So in particular you can look at the quotes for example from Sir Samuel Griffith on the 4th of March in 1891 at the Sydney Convention where they were debating the Constitution, where Sir Samuel Griffith stated, and I quote, We must not lose sight of the essential condition that this is to be a federation of states and not a single government for Australia. This was a sentiment which he actually carried forward whenever the country did actually adopt the Constitution and became a federation. When he was on the High Court, uh, the inaugural High Court, 
He gave a decision in the case of Diemden and Pedder, 1904, number one, Commonwealth Law Reports, 94, where Chief Justice Griffith uh, wrote, and I will now quote, In considering the respective powers of the Commonwealth and of the states, it is essential to bear in mind that each is, within the ambit of its authority, a sovereign state, subject only to the restrictions imposed by the provisions of the Constitution, either expressed or necessarily implied. So the, the idea that uh, Sir Samuel Griffith, and I'm, and I'm sure uh, many of the other framers, including Andrew Inglis Clark, if you look at the history, would have agreed with, is that the state governments, despite being derived from the uh, convention process and this very controlled, uh, non-revolutionary approach to independence, did still have a certain authority and a certain inherent sovereignty to themselves within this federal system, analogous to the uh, American approach to government. That was a principle which hasn't continued and it hasn't uh, taken hold in Australia over the past hundred years due to uh, what happened in the engineers case. Now in the engineers case one of our framers from the 1897 and 98 conventions really uh, was quite strong in his opinion and he led the legal thinking of the High Court for quite some time after coming onto the High Court and uh, taking hold of things in the 1920 Engineers case. This case really changed constitutional law in Australia and the way it's interpreted quite fundamentally uh, for the next hundred years. So Isaacs, who was uh, also the first Australian-born Governor-General, uh, much to the protest of the King, as a High Court judge, gave the decision that federalism, while it was a characteristic of our system, was not really the most important aspect. It wasn't really uh, as essential as our framers had expressed it to be. In that judgment, uh, Justice Isaacs stated, and I would quote, For the proper construction of the Australian Constitution, it is essential to bear in mind two cardinal features of our political system. One is the common sovereignty of all parts of the British Empire. The other is the principle of responsible government. The combined effect of these features is that the expression state and the expression commonwealth comprehend both the strictly legal conception of the king in the right of a designated territory. So whenever you look at this quote and you look at the judgment in the engineer's case and you compare that to the previous uh, judgments that were given by the Griffith Court, you can see that the direction completely changes because the focus on what are ultimately American features of our constitution, such as federalism and intergovernmental immunities, is completely uh, altered and the focus is put on the more British aspects of our constitution, which obviously don't favour the concept of federalism, which is the division of power, but instead favour the accumulation and centralization of power. The finding in the engineer's case puts the primary focus of our constitution on firstly the indivisibility of the crown, not going so far as to say that Australia is a unitary state in any way, but at least pointing out that ultimately the uh, crown is indivisible, that uh, the, the states and the commonwealth are simply uh, separate expressions of the king's ultimate authority. So uh, looking at it in that sense, it, it is almost like a delegation from the king's, king's authority. The commonwealth expresses some of it, the states express some of it. They don't have independently any, any uh, sovereignty in themselves. The other, the other point which is really taken away from this is that the principle of responsible government, which is the Westminster conception of how we run things, is more important than the principle of federalism. Responsible government is you know, the notion that the legislature and the executive, by virtue of uh, Westminster principles, are fused, that you have a prime minister and his ministers who sit in the legislature, but also are in the executive cabinet. And the, the notion of that being a primary concept in our constitution is antithetical to the idea of separation of powers, of federalism, which is dividing the authority of the country. So the engineer's case really swings 
swings the uh, direction of the Constitution in a much more uh, Anglo-centric as opposed to American-centric uh, approach. So aside from this concept of federalism, which has obviously changed quite a lot over the last hundred years, another really important aspect of our Constitution was the separation of powers, which, as I mentioned earlier, comes from both the American as well as, to an extent, the British uh, legal tradition. Separation of powers in Australia plays quite a significant role, uh, most notably in ensuring the independence of the judiciary from interference by the political branches of government, in particular the legislature and the executive. The Boilermakers case in 1956 uh, really gave us quite a large attention, particularly on this division between the political as well as the judicial branches of government and the independence of the judiciary within our constitution. In that case, the court stated, and I quote, when an exercise of legislative powers is directed to the judicial power of the Commonwealth, it must operate through or in conformity with Chapter 3. Chapter 3 does not allow powers that are foreign to the judicial power to be attached to the courts created by or under that chapter for the exercise of the judicial power of the Commonwealth. So Chapter 3 is really the uh, chapter that sets out all the ju judicial powers in the country under the Constitution. So that's, that's the context for that quote. And what this quote is basically saying, what the case basically says, is that the legislature, while it can give uh, roles to the judiciary, cannot give the judiciary roles which are incompatible with its character as a judiciary, as a court. The court must be independent, the court must be functioning in a manner which is separate, and that the constitution is the basis for that separation of powers. In Australia, the Westminster and uh, responsible government elements, which I'm going to touch on a little bit quite soon, uh, means that you don't really get much separation between the political branches of government, the legislature and the executive. It's very difficult to actually pinpoint the differences at certain times. Uh, and it is quite seamless that the person who wins the election, the party that wins the election, will also run the executive the only separation we really find meaningfully in our constitution is between the legislature executive with the judiciary. The judiciary is meant to be independent in Australia. In Victorian Steve Doring and General Contracting Co. Uh, v. Dignan, 1931, the High Court of Australia actually held that it was impossible and inconsistent with the British tradition to actually insist upon a strict separation between legislative and executive powers under our constitutional system. So really looking for that American style uh, separation is going to be impossible in Australia. It's a necessity of our system that you must deal with the uh, collusion between the legislature and the executive. So in, in that sense, going back to what I was saying about the American constitution and the way they do things, the Australian Constitution is actually, by design, quite different uh, in that it isn't very strictly separating those two branches of government. The results of which will be discussed in later podcasts um, can be disadvantageous uh, as well as advantageous. It really depends upon your political ideas and whether you believe that government should have more power or less power. But ultimately, uh, as a constitutional norm, the separation of powers really in Australia is directed at protecting the independence of the judiciary. So keep that in mind as we go forward. So the next uh, very important aspect of our constitution and our system of government, which I've alluded to and I've touched on a little bit, but I you know, focus on a little bit more here, is the Westminster aspects of our government. Westminster referring to obviously the uh, British style of government, the principle of Westminster government and responsible government tied together, obviously, is very much the way our, our system functions on a day-to-day -day basis. In our constitution, the Westminster style of government was adopted rather than the American system of government, which is very, very different. Our system is similar to both in that it is bicameral. Our Senate is empowered in a more similar fashion to the United States equivalent, save, of course, for the power of uh, executive and judicial appointment approvals, and also powers relating to impeachment, because in our constitution we have a crown and we have a, 
a monarch and the monarch's representative, there really isn't the same need to impeach an independent president for wrongdoing. So we, we don't have any of those equivalent powers in our constitution. But nonetheless, it is a very similar bicameral structure, not only to the US, but also to the UK. The UK has the House of Commons and the House of Lords. The US has the House of Representatives and the Senate, just like us. So we have adopted those similar features, though very much on a day-to-day -day basis, our system runs in a much more British fashion. In particular, the UK parliamentary model of responsible government has been foundational for the way government has functioned in Australia since the colonial times. And it's basically a system where the de facto head of government, also known as the Prime Minister, who isn't actually mentioned in the Constitution explicitly, and the Executive Cabinet, who is the Ministers, are also members of the House of Representatives and the Senate. So more or less, you have this fusion between the legislature and the executive, just like I said, where the prime minister and other elected members of the legislature will actually form the basis of the executive. Uh, and that means, like in the UK, they must undergo what is called question time, where the opposition in the legislature will have direct access, whether it be in the uh, House of Representatives or the Senate, to the ministers and will grill them, so to speak, on government actions and what they're doing with their time. There's some people who really like the idea of question time, though I think if you watch question time, it doesn't actually function in the way that theoretically it's meant to, whether it be here or in the UK, or I guess in Canada as well, you can look at that as an example. Question time is different in each place, though ultimately it doesn't actually serve the same function which a lot of theorists believe that it does. Nonetheless, as they theorized, it does make the executive directly accountable to the legislature in that, you know, the opposition leader can ask questions and can attack the government directly. It all depends, I guess, on how you view the norms and how you view things. If you enjoy sitting there watching the politicians attack each other for an hour every other day, then this is probably the system of government for you. On the UK model, uh, the de jure head of state, or the de jure head of the executive, is the Queen, and her representative in Australia is the Governor General, and the Governor General will exercise traditional powers such as calling elections, approving ministers, refusing ratification of laws potentially, that's another power. The Queen also has a certain power to uh, not sign off on a law, or also to uh, overturn a law which her uh, delegate has actually signed off on in our constitution. There's also a number of other powers, such as the power to declare war, and of course, as the 1975 dismissal of Gough Whitlam uh, revealed, there is still the reserve authority to sack the government and call for an election. So what this basically means is that whether it be by the design of the Constitution explicitly or by the norms that we've adopted through Westminster systems of government, our Constitution functions in a way which is directly collusive between the legislature and the executive. Uh, it's very much different in that sense from the American system, much more similar to the UK system. So having set out these three fundamental aspects of our Constitution, federalism, separation of powers, and Westminster-style government, I would quickly uh, discuss the concept of amendment within our constitution. So our constitution is not set in stone, it uh, can be changed, and how it's changed is actually quite important. There's a number of misconceptions within the general public that the politicians can just change the constitution as they wish. That's not correct. The constitution can only be expressly changed through a referendum, which is required under section 128 of the constitution. This provision requires that the amendment be proposed and make its way through both Houses of Parliament with the final approval by the Queen or her representative, the Governor-General, that it go to a full vote of the people. Once a referendum vote uh, is called, it must be held no sooner than two months after the passage of the bill and no longer than six months after. So you can't have a premature vote uh, based on a whim. We can't just have a referendum tomorrow if the Parliament 
uh, introduces an amendment bill, it must be at least two months after the bill has been introduced. However, it can't be more than six months. So the issue in the constitutional sense must be a fresh issue. It must be something which people are talking about now. It must be something which is being considered now and during which there is a number of robust debates. That's the uh, impression which you get from that provision. In order for a referendum to be successful, though, it is quite a high standard. So it will only be successful if it receives what is called a double majority. This means that it receives a majority of voters overall, which is the popular voting element within the process, as well as a majority of states, which is the federal element. So this means that if you have 60% uh, of the population voting for your amendment to the constitution, but only two out of the six states ultimately vote yes to that amendment popularly, that means that the amendment will ultimately fail because the constitution attempts to ensure that small states like Tasmania or South Australia are not being held hostage by large states like Victoria and New South Wales with huge populations. So ultimately this is to distribute the power among the various states of Australia to ensure that no one state, just because it has a large population, can get its way every time. So the only way you'd be able to pass an amendment to the constitution, in essence, is to have not only 51% of the population at large in the country voting yes, but also you'd have to have at least four out of the six states voting yes overall as well. Now, if the amendment in, in particular concerns an issue which will affect a particular state, such as in cases of changing a border or changing the minimum parliamentary representation of a state, this will also require a third majority, aside from the double majority, there's another majority required, and that's a majority in the specific state that's being affected. So if, for example, the amendment that was proposed was attempting to exclude Tasmania from having any representatives in the Senate, just taking a really extreme example, Tasmania would have to have a uh, majority yes vote and be part of that double majority in order for the triple majority to be satisfied. Because it's affecting Tasmania, Tasmania would have to vote yes. On that basis, the constitution blends not only popular but also uh, representative elements and federal elements to ensure that the constitution is not subject to the whim of temporary majorities which may arise in the larger states like New South Wales and Victoria, which historically have always had a populative advantage over smaller states. So this is really something which by design is meant to be difficult to change. That's something which you need to keep in mind. Now the other method of amendment, which is something a little bit more taboo that no one likes to really recognise, the other method of amendment is that the High Court reinterpret the Constitution. Now the High Court never says that they reinterpret the Constitution or they change the Constitution. The High Court will always represent what they're doing as they are discovering the true meaning of the Constitution, but in effect the High Court's interpretation of the document as it exists does change the meaning of the Constitution and how things are interacting within our system of government quite significantly. On that basis, the Constitution has now been interpreted to include implied rights, implied limitations, as well as uh, extremely narrow interpretations of certain uh, limitations, as well as new powers, things which were not expressly mentioned in the original uh, conception of the framers. So when you look at it like that, there's one really express method and there's one that is sort of more off the books, but ultimately both of them effectively change the constitution in some way. A formal amendment under section 128 has the potential for much more change, though historically speaking, amendments are not very successful. Only eight out of 44 constitutional amendment proposals which go to referendum have actually been successful over the past hundred years. So it's not a very easy thing to accomplish. So with all of that in mind, I'd like to wrap up this first uh, episode of Surviving Constitutional Law with a little bit of a, a recap 
So today we've discussed not only the foundations, we talked about some of the uh, historical influences, some of the uh, early constitutional ideas which came out of ancient and, and middle age civilizations, modern co and contemporary constitutional ideas, especially the ones which we've adopted from the United Kingdom and the United States. I've taught you a little bit about the uh, key principles which uh, exist in our constitution as uh, guiding ideas within our system of government, particularly the separation of powers, federalism, and also uh, Westminster constitutional norms and approaches to government, as well as a really quick overview on constitutional amendment and what that actually requires in Australia. This is a significant crash course of what is a very, very large subject, though this should, I hope, have given you the benefit of now knowing some of the history, but also, as I stated in the beginning, the importance of this document and this subject to you if you're a lawyer or an aspiring lawyer, or if you are just a very interested person who wants to understand the system of government in Australia. Ultimately, the Constitution, through all of these influences and all these elements, sets out the rules and limitations, the powers, everything that the government is able to do, and how the various governments in Australia interact with each other through things like federalism. Ultimately, that's quite an important thing to know going forward, especially if we're going to start diving into more complex topics. Seeing as Australia started as a colonial system of uh, government and has developed into now states, the first thing which I'm going to cover on the next episode is going to be the authority of state governments and I'm going to set out some of the ideas surrounding state governments before we move into federal constitutional law. The reason why is because there's not a great focus on state uh, constitutional powers and state governments but ultimately it is quite important to know uh, the position of the states within the federation before we start talking about commonwealth powers and commonwealth uh, constitutional norms and ideas. So, having all that in mind, I hope you've enjoyed the first episode of Surviving Constitutional Law with Cameron Shamsabad. I hope you'll join me for the next podcast, and until then, keep reading.